Hey, Pauline, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. And uh, really looking forward to having an interesting talk with you today, Adnan. I do as well. Well, welcome to the Ozark Mountain Publishing Author Series, and I'm glad uh, we were able to connect. Um, I know I mentioned that a lot of times how glad I am to connect with all these different authors because there's always something to you know getting in the way, either technology or some other technical difficulty. So I'm glad we we're able to work this out to where we can talk over the phone. Yes, yes. Right. Well, so uh, where are we going to start? Well, so uh, I just wanted to quickly mention you're author, at least with Ozark, of three different books, um, Spiritual Gold, Holy Ice, and the latest one, Divine Fire. So um, we figured uh, we'll concentrate on Divine Fire, but if there's something that you would like to bring up from the other three, uh, you know, please don't hesitate to. And uh, so, of course, I'm going to mention this later on as well. All the links to all your different books and sites will be in the description below this video. So, but for now... Um, um, let's start out with a little bit about uh, a background about yourself, and then we'll get into your latest book. Oh, that sounds perfect. Um, well, I think I used to love reading as a child. And, um, you know, when I was quite small in school, I had that feeling that I would love to write a book. I mean, I think this happens to many people. And the years roll past and, you know, you, you don't really forget that. Um, I trained as a teacher and later in life, I came across spiritual healing, which is really interesting. There's many different schools of thought on that. But when um, I went to the, a conference of the National Federation of Spiritual Healers, as it was called, it's now the Healing Trust in the UK, because I'm an author who's uh, living and working in the UK. Um, there was a speaker there. And uh, he said that he'd often have people, they'd get better, but then they'd fall back into that same condition that had brought them to see him. And um, he relaxed them and he took them back in time to the course of that. And it was very often in a previous lifetime. And I thought this was really interesting. So after that, I learned how to do past life regression because it is really interesting to trace the problems that we have in this life whether they're rocky relationships or fears and phobias and things, back to their source so that we can be back in control and we can actually use our God-given intelligence to work our way around whatever that problem is and release those old energies from the past. So as I worked with people and helped them to benefit from tracing things back to the source, I did amass quite a lot of material and my old um, ambition about writing a book had never gone away, but I hadn't got a structure for it. And you can't just have a lot of unrelated little interesting nuggets of things, not for a satisfactory book. It would give you articles and things like that. But anyway, so I, I really had that dream of still writing. And one day I was just in my house, just pottering about doing normal things. When this title dropped into my mind, it was like my higher self was telling me the title for the book was Spiritual Gold, Holy Ice, Divine Fire. And I thought, wow, what beautiful words. And I was told that the spiritual gold would have some of the most important lives that I had um, recollected. The holy ice would be about the crystal skulls and about their origins and the, you know, the mysterious legends about them, what the source of that was. And Divine Fire would be focused on the future. All these books would link together because there are themes of how we are living at a very, very pivotal moment in time. And we can either get it right or we can get it wrong. There's um, environmental crises, there's all sorts of things going on in the world. And we do have a choice, what we think, what we do, even just more us in our little daily lives today, we do affect the quantum field with our thoughts and our feelings and our choices. I mean, even when we go shopping with our person, buy food and services and goods, who we buy them from makes a huge difference. Are we supporting the sort of businesses that are harming the planet or are we being a little bit more thoughtful and um, perhaps buying um, organic vegetables or contributing to Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace or something. It's just like being mindful about the repercussions of the small things you do in your daily life 
can add up if everybody does that, make a huge difference. Anyway, so I had the title and at that point I thought it was one book. So I, I, I did work for several years on it. I had to do a lot of research sessions. Somebody requested me to get the information. And uh, that was quite a long period where, where the, the book was sort of slowly growing and coming together. And um, when the manuscript was submitted to Ozark, they read it and they sent it back to me and they said, well, break it up. It's too big. It's not one book. Break it up and we'll have another look. And that's when the penny dropped and I realized Spiritual Gold was a separate book. Holy Ice was a separate book. Divine Fire was a separate book. Although they all do link together in a way, each one stands separately. But the same themes about having the compass to guide you through life, being aware of the map of time and having the keys to the future is what links them. And you can read any of the three books in any order. It doesn't really matter. They don't have to be in the order that, that they were written. They go around in a circle, if you like, and the information builds. And as you read them, and even uh, some people reread them several times, you're understanding them in a deeper and deeper way. Because I know in those words that I was given in the regression sessions, there are keys, keys to awaken higher consciousness. Now, I wasn't told what those keys were, but I do know they're there. And I do know reading the books is a helpful thing to try and affect the quantum field, try, try and help us all get the right outcome, because we could potentially have a golden age just around the corner, or we could potentially have a total disaster. And the only thing that makes the difference is us. What we think, what we do, what we feel, and um, partly what we know. Um, so that's how the books come to be. And Spiritual Girl came out in 2018. Holy Ice, I think, I think it was 2019. And Divine Fire is the last, and that came out, I think it was 2020. It was when we were having lockdown, that's when that one came out. Well, Pauline, uh, can you please get into uh, a little bit of the premise of Divine Fire, and, and then uh, we'll, we'll discuss that now. Right, well, Divine Fire is the book that's focused on the future. It does have three past lives in it because they were very relevant. You know, where we, when you understand where we've been, you can see very clearly where we're going. And um, those who uh, forget the past are doomed to repeat it is that very famous old saying, isn't it? And it is true. But, um, right, so divine fire. Well, <laughs> it's got quite a wide scope. It has um, spiritual alchemy from the 18th century in France. And there's a sort of mystery there where there is um, a young lady, her grandfather dies and he comes to her in her, in her dreams and he's very disturbed because he didn't do something for his own father. Now, his own father had been a spiritual alchemist and this was a secret society he'd belonged to and there was a lot of persecution. And the poor great-grandfather had ended up in prison because the people in power thought he had the secret of alchemy. And on the basis level, that means turning base metals into gold. But spiritual alchemy is about turning the person into spiritual gold. It's about becoming more of our divine nature, becoming closer to God and the divine. And they were really a secret society of spiritual seekers. And the church of the time, you know, several hundred years ago, felt very threatened by that. And that's why they were persecuted. Anyway, it's a sort of mystery story that unfolds as various pieces of information come to light. And um, <laughs> it, it, um, there's so much in that book. There's past lives, there's parallel lives, and there's future lives. So the parallel lives are to do with the forces of change that are surrounding us and are uh, focusing on the world and are bringing change because we're going through quite a rocky period at the moment and we will be until the middle of this century. We're going through a shaking up and a purging process and disharmony is being brought to the surface to be resolved and to be shed. So 
there will be lots of very uncomfortable events happening in people's personal lives and out there on the world stage. And we can see that out pictured, can't we, every time we switch on the news. Um, and the future lives are also very interesting because we have alternative timelines. So the future is cut from the fabric that we're weaving now with our thoughts, our feelings and our actions. We're making the, the potentials for which the future will be formed from. And those potentials we have control over because they are our thoughts and feelings and actions that are creating them. So I had a little look along the most likely timelines to manifest. And there's um, quite a variety there. So really, we do have the power. We have the power to step into a golden age after this rather uncomfortable shaking up <laughs> until the middle of the century. Or we have the, um, the power of doing nothing. And, well, we saw what COVID did, didn't we? So you could imagine there could be much more virulent viruses and plagues and diseases. We could actually face a, an extinction scenario or somewhere in between. But we are facing environmental damage at the moment. You know, they have all these conferences, these um, international gatherings of leaders to discuss what they're going to do. And um, we are at this pivotal time. So we are unfortunately set to have more damage. There will be increased storms and there will be flooding and there will be drought areas that are getting bigger because we have already had since the industrial revolution we've had global warming there's more carbon dioxide in the air today than there has been at any point since humans were on the planet which is quite scary when you think that's carbon dioxide and less oxygen and it's the oxygen that we need um right adnan i need a break here <laughs> Okay, no, I, I get right. carried away and then I forget what what I was um, what I was saying. Well, we're um, basically just uh, to you were going over the the past life, future life, and I was basically asking you to, to if you can give me a premise, the main premise of the book. So maybe if you can continue just from um, yes, yes, maybe yes, 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 yes. I'll just say a bit more about the future lives and then the main premise of the book. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right, so so I, I had a look at various timelines, and um, I'd like to think that we are waking up, that our collective consciousness is beginning to help us to remember, to remember that there are different ways of being in the world. And um, there's so much devastation with forest fires and rainforests being cut down and all the rest of it, but there is a, a very strong chance that Around about 2030, people will have learned enough about this and that things will begin to get better. And, um, well, I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll just have to see. But I did look at one life that was um, set about um, 2,300 years from now, where things were indeed very different, where there were a lot less people. I think there'll be a lot less people anyway from the middle of this century onwards because fertility levels are falling. We have so many synthetic estrogens from plastic leaking out into the environment and that's one of the causes. But anyway, the, um, the people were still around. There were a lot more tidal waves. There was a lot more disruption on the seabed. And... Um, they had a, a very different relationship to their bodies. And also they had friends from the stars who had given them technology. They had very healing music that would restore their cellular health to the bodies. And they did a lot more traveling out of their bodies. And um, a very different value system. And they lived in communities. I lived in a coastal community in that life on the west coast of Scotland. And uh, it was a long life. People lived 
well, because of the healing music and, you know, all the improvements and, and things and the very simple diet, which was seaweed based, which was very mineral rich. Um, we did live a long life and beauty and poetry and those sorts of things were very valued. There weren't factories. The whole setup was so different. And um, it was a very nourishing life. So although it could look like a disaster from where we're standing because things were different, people didn't have personal wealth and, um, and had a much more communal way of living, it was still very rewarding. So I do think we have a future to go to, but I think we need to be very careful. We've had warnings about this. I mean, you you can see from the news that we are indeed at this watershed time, that um, things are balancing on a nice edge. But I think the message of my books is that it's hopeful that we can do it. If we do open our eyes to what's going on, if we do raise our consciousness and increase our I'm not saying spiritual awareness, but our our gratitude for being in the world, you know, admiring sunsets and giving love to the world, admiring flowers and plants and all the rest of it. It's not an, a waste of time at all because you're actually changing and putting a positive influence into the collective consciousness, which we are all sort of subliminally linked into. And for those of us who can sort of keep a little light burning somewhere inside is going to help everybody it's like if everybody had a little candle and you saw our world from space it would be a world of light if everybody's little candle just gutted and went out because they couldn't be bothered or they got so down they thought they didn't matter then from space it would look like a world of darkness so it's like we are only small and we have our just our little lives but we do matter and we can help to really make a huge difference and um, really shift things in a positive way. Because although you can look at the future and you can see these timelines, nothing set in stone because we're at the point of power now in our lives where we can change or we can sign a petition, we can do something helpful and we will change things. We can tip the scales in our favor as a species instead of um, for going further down the slide onto oblivion. I mean, you know, the universe is like um, a grand sort of adventure for the creator watching what happens. And the universe would see our demise with hardly a blink because we're just one of very many species. And if we can't look after ourselves and we can't look after our world, you know, you have to ask yourself, do we deserve to continue? But we, but we can do that. We do have the power. We just need to wake up to the fact that we can't. And um... Well, Pauline, I have a, a quick question. So these all these different changes in the way uh, your book has been written, is this about... so? So, for example, I can definitely see where if somebody already has a belief system where whatever you might be saying might be in contradiction to that, um, they would they would not kind of um, they wouldn't be as open to to the to the information that you're you know presenting. Yeah. So, what um, what would you suggest? You to don't somebody? have to believe yeah. it. You can take it as an allegory. If you think about Jesus in the Bible, he spoke in parables, didn't he? Right. And he gave the message that he was conveying in the form of a story. So you can quite happily read my books, all of them, and take it as, as, as fiction or as a story. But the story will tell you things, and parts of the important parts of it will stay with you. So I'm not expecting anybody to believe um, everything that I write at all. But I was just so full of excitement about what I found that I wanted to share it. And the best way to share it is to put it, well, we can talk about it like we are now, but to put it in a book and then that, those books go out into the world and they will come into the right hands to the people who need them or, or you know, are interested in those topics. Right. I mean, past lives, the big thing is the fear of death, isn't it? That stalks everybody, whether we think about it or not. And if you're afraid of dying, it makes you very selfish in this life. 
And um, but you know you, you can hoard all the wealth in the world and be a billionaire, but you have how many years on this planet? A finite right. number, and you can't take it with you. So it's like what happens when you leave? Well, my books will give you lots of answers as to what happens when you leave because the past life therapist have taken people, so many people over the threshold of death and to see what they learnt in their lives, to see whether those people that were in the past life or in their present life, because that explains a lot of dynamics in relationships, and to see what the parallels with the past life are with their present, because these are the questions that bring a lot of learning. But we're not prisoners of our past. We can do a whole load of healing, lots of different things to resolve things. Forgiveness is a simple thing. It's very hard to do, but when you've done it, it's like you've shed a weight. But um, just, there is so much to do. It's, it is a huge field, past life healing. Pauline, I wanted to ask, um, uh, just so I guess set the record straight, I have not read your book, so if the question seemed a bit silly, that's why. Um, so, Oh, no, there's you, no such thing as a silly question. Do you, you see, I'm so enthusiastic and so close to it all. I can find it very hard to talk about it, but if you ask, because I just get lost in it. <laughs> but right. if you ask me a specific question, then that focuses me. And then that well, it was uh, something in reference you were talking about, um, how you had a past life, uh, uh, talking about this, this future Earth, and that there was some kind of um, technology given by there these, was, these yes. outer world well, visitors. Be because Are they I have had a, a lifetime of, of contact with right. ETs, which is not necessarily a good thing, and it's not something I'd wish on anybody. You only know about it when they make mistakes. I have a big scar down the back of my right leg, and I have I have had missing time. But most of the, the sessions are, are nighttime ones where you just have a, a briefing and they collect energy, and that doesn't really interfere with you. Yeah. Well, but, I definitely, if you feel comfortable, please get a little bit into that. But the question I wanted to ask is, regarding then, that means... If there was some kind of future contact, is there then... Oh, yes. I said what's that going I on, what's going on now? There. I'm pretty it's sure they're involved now as well. When you're taken up to the dimensional bridges, which are really what craft are, um, there is like a briefing session, and in the center of the room, there's very often an energy beam that goes up. And this energy beam takes... Well, it, 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 it will dispense information. There will, there will be figures and symbols and things in it but it will also show pictures um and that technology was given to us in that very far future life and we had this energy beam in the center of our communal room and we'd have the news the earth news on it and um well i, I there would be lots of other little technological hacks that we've been given we wouldn't be given anything that could be dangerous but we had evolved at that point where we were no longer what you could call homo brutalis, which is what we are now. We you know, think of the wars on the planet, very brutal. Um, we were actually entrusted with some things, but we certainly wouldn't be ready for them now, would we? Right. Well, um, so, like, how much of this um, contact is actually already started that eventually leads to this more interactive and technology exchange? Because I'm pretty sure if they're involved in the future, they're already in the process of being involved now. Um, well, I'm sure they are. And uh, I'm sure that our governments also know a great deal more about it than we're being told. I don't know if we'll ever be told that ETs are here and they're monitoring us. I think we're being drip fed information with a lot of the films and things that come out of Hollywood and I think young people today will be probably quite comfortable with that concept whereas for older people it might be more scary um, but I think I think we are being educated there may never be an announcement that they're here it's just like a knowing I think that's building with the generations right so um, regarding uh, let's say, is, so having a regression, is this something that can everybody go through or would you even recommend it if anyone that's pretty new to this would is interested uh, right. to kind of maybe go through that? What, what would you say? Yes, that's an interesting, um, interesting question there. I would say 
you have to want it. You have to really want it. And not everybody does. And not everybody would benefit. But if you do have um, a problem or some anomaly that's just irritating your mind and it won't go away and you want to get to the bottom of it, then it is worthwhile arranging to have a regression. Because basically you're just finding out more about yourself, aren't you? You're finding out about hidden and buried experiences. But you have to be in a stable situation emotionally to be able to deal with what you may learn. So that's why I wouldn't uh, have anybody rush into this. They have to want it, really want it. Uh, yeah, especially, uh, I mean, especially if you kind of uh, uh, generally hesitant person, uh, I would even see people being afraid finding out something that they really don't. Well, like, yes, you know, <laughs> I, yes, it's very different thinking something might be the case uh, to finding out that something actually is the case. Yeah. And uh, when I did have my first regression to find out how I got that scar down the back of my right leg, I had a week of fear, abject fear, because I realized I was being taken. I couldn't stop it. It would be happening at times not of my choosing. And I also had an awareness that they had records that they'd kept about previous times when they had taken me. So this was part of an ongoing pattern, which I could not stop. And I had great fear. I had a pain in my sort of um, digestion, you know, stomach area. I was really quite traumatized for at least a week until I decided I wasn't going to be hunted by it anymore. I was going to be the hunter. I was going to hunt out how I could stop them and what it was about. Well, it isn't that easy to stop them, but when you actually go back and find the contract you have with them, then you are more in control because sometimes some of those species have not honored the contract. They've taken a lot more liberties than they were entitled to. And um, that really stopped me being pestered by the people who'd given me the scar. But I think there is a very positive sign. You know, you know John Mack, the late Harvard professor of psychiatry, who wrote a very good book that unfortunately is no longer in print, um, you know, called Abduction, um, Human Contact with Aliens. And he found that a lot of the people having contact actually had a sort of a creative epiphany or that they had a benefit from it. It was changing them in a positive way. And I can quite believe that. So when you, um, do you know specifically maybe if, if to say somebody is from this certain location that not everyone is usually aware of really makes not much sense, you know, because we, we don't have a connection to the place and whatnot, but is there kind of recollections of how at least how they looked, you know, or it, was that um, something that you still haven't really figured out? Oh, no, no, I know how they look. I'm quite a visual person. I mean, I, I trained as an artist and I was an art teacher. Um, so I am quite a visual person. Um, the ones that gave me the scar were what you call the greys. If you ever saw the X-Files, you would have seen them on that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's, there's many others. <laughs> many others. And sometimes we're not ready to see them, so they're sort of pixelated out. <laughs> You're aware that they're there. You know in a dream when you know people are with you, but you can't always see them. Right. But you're aware of the events that happen. Well, a lot of it's like that when you were getting the regression memories back. Because you're, um, you're well, I'll call it subconscious or superconscious, does try and protect you. You've told it firmly that you want to know, which is why you're on the in the regression session. But it, it will protect you and it will pixelate out or perhaps not allow you to remember some of the things that might be distressing well, you know, we always um, have an assumption about when we talk about uh, abductions, particularly in, in relations to the different ET groups, uh, from your understanding, what would, would have been the reason for them basically abducting you? Well, the ones we call the greys are very old, and they I haven't been able to reproduce satisfactory for a very long time. So they make new bodies by cloning, and they... Um, there's a certain amount of etheric energy in the cells of a body, but 
as you clone and you clone and you clone again, that etheric energy is wearing out and getting very thin. So they've been taking cells from our body. They've been taking sperm and eggs, but also what they were getting from deep in my calf was cells to be used in the cloning process. And they would use the etheric energy in our material to sort of piggyback their own DNA in um, because that gave them a better body. There was also a hybrid breeding program where they were breeding in some human traits. I don't think that's been a terribly good success. I think they've possibly abandoned that. And um, I think perhaps the greys are not nearly as active as they were. They may even have left. But there's still plenty of other ETs that are around. We were destabilizing them. They have a, the greys have a very high of mind. And um, are, we aren't, are we? We're quite anarchic, quite maverick individual people. And the energy of, even though you're very sedated during an abduction, the energy of our own being was um, changing the thought forms on the craft and it was destabilizing them and the hive mind was losing its its grip uh, so we we were deemed dangerous i think so um, now having having had the experiences that you've had um is this is this something that you would recommend people generally not fearing or I mean, especially if you how do you kind of me you know how do you well maybe you said you remembered contracts that you had and so they kind of gave you power back but yeah generally if you yes. call yourself an abductee that usually kind of always leaves you behind as a, a victim mentality so it's like what what, what can yeah. you do well, well my best advice would be to find the team that is looking after you because a lot of these um contracts and these situations have been set up in that between lifetime before you actually incarnate so if you go back to the very very earliest contact you will find the team that is sponsoring you you will find your people i mean we've lived throughout the universe in many places and in many different dimensions we just happen to find ourselves on earth now so we do have friends in other dimensions and we do have friends on the craft so if you find that team that's looking after you, that knew about you incarnating and that have been giving you briefing sessions and basically helping you, Earth's a very difficult schoolroom. And um, they're keeping an eye on you. If you do feel fear and you get that spooky feeling at night or when you're driving on a dark road at night, dial home. Think of them. That's the only advantage, I would say, to doing a regression session if you're bothered by this thing about alien contact, to find the team that is sponsoring you and then you can telepathically dial home whenever you feel fear and they will monitor what's happening with you because we do have implants uh, for that helps us to be found by them when they're looking for us and um, the implants are in the physical body sometimes, sometimes they're in the etheric and the astral bodies. But you have a telepathic link with them. You can dial home and they can check out what's happening with you and they can hold you down in a holding beam where you are so that an undesirable element in the ET world cannot take you. I found that was the most comfort and that was the best piece of the jigsaw that I found. I got a better understanding of the whole thing. And when I found that there were beings I could call for help, then that did take the fear away. So, Pauline, uh, do you do you go into some of these um, personal stories in the, the book or any of the I do, books? I do. I mean, it's a huge, a huge topic, right. um, E.T., human so contact. So the regressions and that would be worth the main focus probably point. several books in its own right. But the second half of Divine Fire is where I share some of my experiences and some of the briefing experiences are in the concluding chapters because they're very important for this time that we're finding ourselves in, this pivotal time that we are balancing on a knife edge of which way our future is going to fall out. They won't interfere. We're not going to be saved from ourselves, but we are being monitored. And a little bit of subliminal education takes place, place in these briefing sessions. Now, I've never known whether everybody has these briefing sessions or whether it is just certain people that they've tagged down different incarnations. 
sometimes it runs in families. But it is more than possible that everybody gets at some point, you know, the um, subliminal education because it really is important as a species that we step up to the plate and we save our world. We have a so beautiful world. You know, it's like a beautiful, luminous jewel in the cosmos. We have so much water, beautiful, rich atmosphere. We have plants and life forms and insects and animals and sea creatures in a huge variety. Some worlds are very arid. And plenty of these ETs we're monitoring us have destroyed their own world because what we're embarked on is a very, very common pattern where you get exactly what's happening here. And... Um, People get selfish. People don't look at the bigger picture. Um, things are exploited. Um, accidents happen and worlds get turned into deserts or explosions rip away lots of the atmosphere. All sorts of things happened. And um, a lot of those beings now are just left living on craft. And they have to go to worlds to refuel their craft from time to time. But they haven't really got home anymore. And as the generations roll by, and roll by, it's much harder to have a satisfying existence. You know, the universe is full of crystals. Crystal, those sort of gases combine and form worlds and uh, solid matter and crystals. And crystals are throughout the universe. And they're a sort of, um, not exactly a bugging device, but they are a means for angels, if you like, higher beings, the creator to monitor what's going on. And you get a benefit from the crystals on the world that you're on because we have um, bodies that appear to be quite solid. But if you think about blood and you think about um, water and we are about, I don't know, is it about 70% water or something? Those fluids crystallize out. So we're a little bit like liquid crystals and the heartbeat of planet Earth does resonate through us and nourishes us. And if you're living in a craft you're not going to get that, are you? So there's a sort of death of spirit that happens when you're not hearing the heartbeat of the world and the crystals. So Pauline, so the the book then is basically a combination of your experiences and your regressions that basically come with this overall message for us. Yes, yes, yes. That we we um, I look at various timelines. I look at the spiritual alchemy from the past and uh, a lot of the the ET contact sessions and things. And um, yes, we, we, we are at this very important point. So if we open our eyes and realize that what we do matters, then we can all really make a huge difference and we can have a future. I mean, you know, you have to think what sort of world are we leaving for our children's children, don't you? Right. So would would you say that at this point we're truly at this 50-50 stage? Or, I, I, I would, or, yes, I would we... say that we were already tipping down into the alarm clocks. You know, okay. the alarm bells are, are really ringing. We, we are, we, we're sort of on a pathway that will take us to one and a half degrees centigrade warming globally. And we could be heading for a much warmer scenario than that. So we have already done irreversible damage. It's just a question of stopping making it worse because we can still have a good life if we manage to shepherd uh, our energies and resources and be stewards, very responsible stewards of our world. And if we don't, if we just carry merrily on as we are, um, well, then we're going to reap the whirlwind that we've sown. So, Pauline, is it's there just any... common sense, isn't it? Right, right. It's been, no, that's what the scientists tell us. It's it's not a, some strange arcane knowledge from the inner worlds. That is true. But but what my books are saying is we matter. We don't just have to suffer this. We can actually stop it and change it for the better. And so, Pauline, in conclusion, is there any any other final thoughts or certain subjects you would like to cover that that uh, I, I are think covering in the books? Schools. Crystal skulls are really, really interesting, aren't they? There's various legends about them, and uh, there are some ancient ones that they have found no tool marks, and they don't know how they were made. And I, I did begin my research looking at past lives long ago, where I had interacted with some of the ancient crystal skulls. And, um, you know, there was a lot of hype about 2012, wasn't there? 
Mm-hmm. And there was disaster movies. And then there was that Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And there's an awful lot of truth in these things, although they are entertainment. But there's an awful lot of crystal skulls being made now, pouring out of the world's workshops in China and Brazil and all over the place. Because somewhere we are remembering and people are buying these because they wouldn't be making them if nobody was buying them, would they? They'd have soon stopped. But there are online school communities on Facebook um, where like-minded people who like crystal skulls get together and share photos of their own and experiences they've had. Because anybody who had anything to do with those ancient crystal skulls, which were oracles in the ancient world and could do prodigious feats of healing and all sorts of things, Anybody who had anything to do with them, that is like an alarm clock at the back of your mind going off and attracting people to the crystal skulls that we have today. They have never been so available. They have never been so inexpensive. In those old days, you had to go to temples to see crystal skulls, but now you can have a whole row of them on a shelf in your own home, bought quite cheaply off eBay (laughs) in any crystal you like. And um, they are a, a fantastic force for good because they help us remember our deeper wisdom and they help us lift our energies and they help us lift the collective consciousness just seeing them even gives a visual message that goes in through the eyes to the optic nerve of the brain triggers subconscious memories and helps to make us feel good and better and more on track to have a more spiritually fulfilling life you don't have to have any beliefs I mean, crystal itself is very uplifting, isn't it? I love looking at crystals and going to crystal shops and things. But when you have it carved into a skull, it's all curves. Crystals are naturally straight-sided. They have that lattice pattern that they all develop along. But when they're carved into curves, they become like radios, if you like. They, they, They are changed by the energies that can access them and enter them and work through them. And they're carved into skulls because they're symbols for consciousness. And they're, they're carved into human skulls, which is like we all have one of those. And that's made of crystals of calcium. And, um, you know, within our own bodies, like our bones are. So they are keys to raise our consciousness and they are tools to help us now at this pivotal moment. So I really love crystal skulls. And... Um, that's the Holy Ice book is the one that focuses on them, but they do creep into both the other books. They are mentioned in Spiritual Gold because I did know Chris Morton and Kerry Louise Thomas who wrote The Mystery of the Crystal Skulls. I knew them when they were writing it, and it's a, a very important book. It was a BBC a documentary that they wrote a book about that they'd made the film for the BBC because they're filmmakers. And that's what triggered back in the 90s. That's what, when that book came out, that is what triggered my interest. But it took a good few years before I actually had the time to set aside to research my own past life memories with them. And um, they could also come into the Divine Fire book because they are, they are tools to help us. And we are subconsciously drawn to them which is why they're just flooding out of the crystal workshops today. You just have a look on eBay and you'll see all sorts. Just put in crystal schools on eBay and see what comes up. And um, sometimes we have a link with a particular crystal and, you know, you just feel it when you see the picture on the screen. But I've been doing a lot of research with new crystal schools this last year or two and I've been meditating and working with them and they've taken me on journeys into their crystal and they've shared all sorts and I have been working on a fourth book, which is about working with new crystal skulls. So it's all about tools to help us wake up, raise our consciousness, be aware of life in a different way, to be on the planet in a different way so that we can have a beautiful golden future. We don't have to have a struggle. We have to just really wake up now, do things differently, and you know, then we'll reap the benefit. Well, Pauline, uh, thanks very much for that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad you were able to cover all the different subjects that you talked about, and you know, even you know, going into you know different tangents and whatnot. It's all part of the one and the same. So, you know, and this is a perfect opportunity to say if there's more that people want to read up on, just check out the different books that are there. There's, you know, still more information that can be covered within an hour for an interview. Yes. Well. 
Spiritual Gold, which was the first book, has my personal journey into how I came to do healing and um, past lives and how I work and things. And it has the most important lives. Uh, one of which was when I was in the early Christian church and before that, when I actually heard Jesus speak. We have some of his words in the Bible, uh, but an awful lot of them got lost. And the things that I heard make more sense of some of the fragments that have come down to us. In the early church, the symbol was the fish. It was when the Romans took over Christianity as um, a, a, a sort of a state tool for um, controlling people that they changed an awful lot of the messages. Because in the early church, it was letters, it was epistles that were sent round to the different outlying communities. And then when politics got involved and the Romans took that on as the official religion, or unofficial religion, then a lot of things got edited out over the centuries. So, you know, what we have today does con uh, contain some of the, um, the things that it should, but an awful lot of them aren't there. And there's been a skew in the slant of things, you know, about guilt and punishments and hell and things. Um, so it's a very interesting book to read from that point of view. And also it does take us to other worlds, and there's quite a spectrum of, of um of things in that book right. and then the holy ice book is the one as i said that's very focused on the crystal skulls because there is native american legends that say how they've been scattered and they will be coming back together to save us at a very very difficult and dangerous time in the world and that time is now that's part of this watershed moment that the skulls are being brought out into the world you know, there was the Wolf Song tour, I think it was 1998, and native elders from various countries came together with crystal skulls and came to the UK amongst other places. And uh, I went along and I had a private sitting with the old ancient skull called Shana Ra. I asked a question and I saw a vision in it which gave me the answer to my question. So I write about that in Spiritual Gold as well, and that's mentioned as well in Holy Ice, because that's the start of me taking Crystal Skull seriously, because I had that experience. I got, I received an answer to a question that was important to me in the skull. And then I just chased through the various stages of Atlantis, and they were, they were brought to what we think of Atlantis from previous places and they're as old as the hills, the very ancient skulls. And I think most of them are in native ethnic hands and they're being looked after and guarded. There's one or two in the museums. But um, they are a phenomenon. They really are a phenomenon. And um, that's why I've been researching new ones because I was wondering, well, you know, I know the old ones. You can have clear audience experiences. You can have information and and um, wisdom from them. You can see things in the crystal. It's like a crystal ball. I mean, that's where the whole crystal ball divination thing came from. Gazing into the crystal of the skull in Atlantis. There were the famous 13 in the main temple, and people would come from all the known world to trade with Atlantis. Atlantis was the ruling power, and they collect the taxes from the other countries and things. And the kings had to send their successors for training at the royal court. And so everybody who was anybody would have been to the main temple and seen the skulls. So that's how this idea of 13 comes, because there were 13 of them on a golden stand. Mm. But there actually were a lot more than that. Okay. But, um, anyway, well, so, you know, there were legends. And also in the first book, Spiritual Gold, I remember being an apprentice painter in the Hall of Records beneath the Sphinx. And there are recorded bands of history in there. We should have opened that in 1999. I do think people have been in, but I think the information that's been held there has been repressed. I don't think it's been allowed out because it would um, definitely raise a few eyebrows and ruffle a few feathers. Because we're at this watershed time and um, we really, really need to get things right anyway if you want to know more about that get spiritual gold and if you want to know more about the crystal schools get holy ice and if you want to know more about what may be lying ahead of us in the future get divine fire 
All right. Well, thanks, Pauline. I appreciate that. Couldn't have done it better myself. And as always, I'm going to have all the links in the description below. So if anyone wants to get the books, read up more on it. Um, I believe I have your website. So maybe if somebody wants to contact you, I'm pretty sure this should be Oh, of course they can. They can email me. I love to hear from people. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Pauline, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day and hope we can do this again sometime. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, I do love talking about my books, Adam. I get a bit worried about it. And um, as I say, I get so enthusiastic, I just shoot off all over the place. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> but, well, you know, it's, I really it's do understandable. enjoy it. And thank you very much for today. All right, well, you take care and uh, I will uh, talk to you later. Have a good day. And you, you have a good day too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.